Hello, everyone. I'm Comron. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we'll be recapping our favorite moments from Dead House Gates, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is our final episode mm. covering this book. Now, this podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the book set in the Malaysian universe. It's not a book review, and it's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading these amazing books. Just know that Comron and I know that this series is the best fantasy stories ever written, and we're approaching this from a pure fanboy point of view. No literary critique. We're just going to sit here and look at this. The, well, we're not going to be looking at it. We're done. This is going to be our highlight episode because we finished Dead House Gates. I can't believe we're finally done. So <laughs> the, let's get to this recap episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There will be spoilers for those that have not read Yo, yes. this book. So be advised, this is a full spoiler of Dead House Gates today. Yes, We're talking yes. about all our favorite moments from the book. Yeah, it's the all spoiler episode. So <laughs> So a quick warning, today's episode will contain descriptions of extreme violence, and it is not recommended for children. Our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon Weekly. Also, we would really like to hear from you, and we really do mean that. So send any feedback or comments that you've got to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right, let's kick this off. The prologue. The first thing I have to say is <laughs> we are deep in the season of rot in Houston, <laughs> Texas this year. The fact that we started covering this book at this time last year, it's the worst time of the year in Houston. Mm -hmm. And I have socialized amongst my <laughs> friend group that it is the season of rot. And nice. everybody seems to appreciate that. We picked that up from the prologue. Oh, and what is so great about that is that we get season of rot in the, in the Dallas area, but it does not compare to Houston because Houston is on the coast. And my good gracious. Yeah, I cannot imagine. <laughs> <laughs> how bad it is down there <laughs> you know, so yes i'm thankful that i live in the hill country i'm out of the rot i mean it's like we get hot days but it, it'll at least be a decent night with a breeze so right now in the prologue this is where we find out that tavora is now the adjunct and yeah. her sister felicin is introduced i like that and the, the interesting fact that I guess I can say this now because there's no spoilers in this book and at this point is the fact that the parans are involved on all fronts in this series and especially by the end of the book but we got adjunct tavora which we assume is up somewhere in the high ranks and gano s last book was left up in some kind of position of power these people being on the front of everything is always kind of interesting and i had not looked at it really like that until we you know and we haven't even got to tavora <laughs> yeah but just the fact that this family is going to be kind of at the forefront of this epic is intriguing to me yeah in many ways i think you and i might have discussed this offline in gardens of the moon but it does feel like that family is critical to this entire story they're yeah. so important to the main events that are going on throughout this series you know it's kind of like <laughs> i'm, I'm going to use a really odd reference here it's almost like a following a family in like a saga like how the west was won or something like that through this big epic period we've got this yeah these siblings that we follow through this upheaval and all this whatever's going on all this wildness that's going on it's just absolutely cool yeah and during the prologue additional details are provided regarding the status of the parent family and what tavora had to do to prove her loyalty to empress lacine Right. She chose to sacrifice the mother. We just found out about this late in the book. I think it was chapter 24, maybe. Yeah. When Felicin was talking about regrets, she regretted the fight she had with Tavora when she blamed Tavora for the death of the parents. Now, the father was already dead, but the mother was chosen to be sacrificed by Tavora. Yeah, that was a really heavy thing. It's a hard price she had to pay. The culling of the nobility <sighs> is introduced. And it's an interesting way to gain the hearts of the masses within conquered territories for the Malazan Empire. Yeah, we learned a little bit about this. It was hinted at in Gardens of the Moon, but uh, it's, man, it's so much more ferocious than I could have imagined. Yeah, Gardens of the Moon was slightly different from the perspective of the Maranth had a specific number yes. that they were trying to reach for retribution. In this case, whenever the Malazan Empire calls the nobility, it's really preying on the bloodthirstiness of the masses. Well, remember they hinted at doing that anyhow, that was coming. Remember, Dujek was in charge of the list. Oh, that's right. He did get rid of it. 
Yes, but that's just because Dujek was in town. But he kept it down because of the, I guess, because well, Dujek's Dujek. He's a good guy. <laughs> yeah, he is. Within that culling, we get to witness the horrific outcome of Bodden sawing off <laughs> Lady Gason's head with a chain. Yeah, that is most assuredly one of the, the first core memories of the book. I'm thinking the whole uh, prologue where they're out being marched through all that stuff is just so awful. But what a, what a brutal, horrific, effective way to start this book. All right, moving on to chapter one. The concept of divers are introduced to us. Previously, we only knew about Soul Taken with the shape-shifting dragons that we saw in Gardens of the Moon. Mm -hmm. Now we have a single consciousness that can be spread among multiple bodies. That is extremely fascinating to me because I could maybe see keeping it together with one or two, but some of those divers get kind of big. I mean, like big packs of them. And how, how does that work? <laughs> Grillin, for example, yeah. the blood flies. You know, how does that work as an intelligence? I guess the does the intelligence ride outside and drive it. I don't, I don't know. It's it's I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever get that answer. But it's just it's a fascinating concept, though. It has to be some kind of hive mind type thing. Yeah, where there's a greater consciousness. That's how I think yeah. it would work. You're right. It's got to be something like that. But you know, yeah, very intriguing. We're introduced to Coltane and the Wiccans as they arrive in the Seven Cities. Yes. And we have that beautiful scene at the docks <laughs> where Duiker, he sees this madman and then he finds out it's Coltane and he's like, that's Coltane. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious, dude. And yeah, that madman is Coltane. Awesome reaction. That makes me laugh out loud. Mm hmm. And then Fiddler and Kalam, they're on the boat with Crocus and Absalar, and that Den Robby comes up on them. Oh. Fiddler deals with it by shooting it <laughs> in the mouth with a cusser. Oh. Now, to remind you of the scale of this thing, it had a 60-foot wide head. Uh, yeah, the head, 60-foot wide. <laughs> Incredibly well, huge. It's like a subway train. It's, <laughs> it's following you. That's a, a subway train would be smaller because those yes. are how wide are those? Twenty like, feet, what, maybe, or something wide. Yeah. So, so maybe the body's only subway train width wide, but I mean, it's like it's like this huge thing. But what? But it's yeah, like I'm, the machine that dug the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> the size of this thing, but but this build up Huge. and all that trash talking when it's like I'm going to eat you. I'm not going to be disrespectful to you, but I'm going to eat you. And it's, it's like they did this to have it oh, blow yeah. it up. It's like oh my good gracious, it's real. Sh it's like oh shut up, boom. <laughs> and they're picking Din Robbie out of their hair for the next hour, I guess. Yeah, very Jaws like with the way it was dealt with. Oh, absolutely brilliant, dude. Following that, Fiddler gets upset with Kalam because Kalam got a little drunk and he spilled the beans to Crocus about <laughs> how the bridge burners chased Quick Ben across the holy desert Raraku. Kalam was allegedly helping them, but Whiskey Jack worked out right. that he was working in concert with Quick Ben and <laughs> Fiddler cuts him off. And he's like, one night of drinking and he knows more than any living historian knows yes. about he just this spilled part the whole story. The secret origin story is just now out in the open to the youngest guy in the party. You know, it's like, yeah, it's just because of the proximity to the greatness of Kalam. How could you not look up to that guy if you're a 17 year old kid? I mean, he'd be godlike in status, right? And Finn, too. Both of these guys, just both these guys, he's hanging with legends. Yeah. Kalam's mission to assassinate Lacine is introduced. <laughs> that's quite the lofty, yeah, lofty goal there. Well, I love that that's introduced in chapter one. Wow. Okay, it's just that early. <laughs> yeah, the early chapters were very long and a lot of stuff was going on because I did notice as I was working through our notes mm -hmm. towards the last five to six chapters, remarkably less seemed to be yes. going on than the early part of the book. No. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. It just seemed mm -hmm. that it was just a lot of yes. stuff was being established. He does that. He sets it all up. He gets us a world built and he does it so brilliantly. And by the time you get to the end, all he's got to do is tie it all up. All right, chapter two. Duerker, we find him blending in with the natives in the trader tent, and we're introduced to some of the tribes and their customs in seven cities within this scene. Really enjoy uh, any time we get to just get down to the to the world building stuff we're talking about. It's, the stuff in seven cities is real awesome for me because I love the desert stuff in particular. I think we both have a big fascination with the desert. Our Dune love shows through for sure. But I love Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> 
So anything with the desert, I'm just totally down for this stuff. It's so it's great stuff. Yeah, I really think that's one of the reasons why I enjoy it so much is that feeling of it's kind of like a bazaar yeah. and there's all these people, food vendors, people putting on these shows, yep. divinations were going on, all, all this kind of stuff. It was a really interesting scene. Yes, agreed. Very much so. Bolt and Sormo are introduced. We find out that Dujek caused the scar on Bolt's face, but Bolt's horse took off Dujek's arm. So that's a huge <laughs> reveal there in terms of backstory for both of them. I had, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to laugh at Dujek. I had forgot. Is this where our love for the crazy horses starts? Because we find out that in retrospect, a horse bit off Dujek's arm. <laughs> It probably helped kick off proceedings for this book because <laughs> yeah. I think that's the first horse incident oh, that is Lord. described. Good gracious. Yeah, that's got to be it because, man, I forgot that it was Bolt's horse that bit that fellow's arm But yeah, great stuff there. Great stuff. I can't remember if it was chapter two specifically if it lists how many crows it took to carry Sormo's soul when he was resurrected. But I'll just put that in here at okay. that concept. Yes. Of the Wiccans and the soul writing being introduced. It wasn't in my notes specifically. I believe that they did list a specific number. I want to say it was either six or eight crows. I believe it was eight. I just can't remember if it was chapter two or not. Okay. Yeah, I can't, I can't either. We get the scene where Malik Rell is taken down a peg when he attempts to order Coltane on behalf of Pormqual. Mm. And they cut him down a little bit. They being Duiker, Bolt... And Coltane himself, they all got yeah. into him. Yes, and I forget that this is the insult, isn't it? Well, it was definitely an insult. I don't know if it would have made a difference in the grand scheme of things. Okay. Because I believe Malik Rell was probably always planning on betraying them. Okay. Just made it worse for them by being the guys that talk trash to him. <laughs> Maybe. We are treated to this whole backstory of Erlatan and the legend of the lone survivor that thought he had caused the collapse of the Gen Rob by dropping a beaker on the floor. This was that massive palace yes. that was built on top of all those ruins yes. and the weight of it was such that the ruins couldn't keep it. The city ate itself. Yes. One survivor and he lived the rest of his life with survivor's guilt thinking he caused the whole thing. It's this kind of detail that makes Erickson so amazing. It's just these small little bits that have no relevance necessarily to the story. But man, it adds an awful lot to the world by this small kind of stuff. But what's interesting about this is the fact that that, that is a very big thing that happens, especially in the old world, in the Middle East in particular. They built a lot. I, mean, I think Jerusalem has been built like I mean, the original Jerusalem's down like 30 or 40 feet minimum down to when the time when Jesus was there. I mean, if that's been built like 15 or 20 times on top of itself, that happens a lot in that, that world. So the idea that gets stacked so high, it just couldn't hold itself anymore is kind of interesting and funny. Don't they keep finding stuff in Rome when they're doing road work? Oh, yeah. When they're digging <laughs> stuff up, they find stuff under there and they have to block uh, yeah. the whole area off and start excavating, see what they found. Yeah, that whole part <laughs> of the world is all ancient world and it's modern meets the ancient. Anytime they find something, it's like, wait, stop. God damn it. <laughs> Here we go again. Heck, some of the stuff under New York City. They got all those tunnels down yes. there. Yeah, they got old abandoned subways down there. We get the interlude with Fiddler saving Kimlock's grandchildren from that child trafficker. Yes. The subsequent meeting between Kimlock and Fiddler. And we find out that Kimlock's last guest was 11 years prior, and it was Dujek. Wow. For me, that's a real core memory about Fiddler saving those kids from that and all that stuff that went on because it's one of the reasons we love Fiddler and these guys because they're such good stand-up folks. Yeah, that's pretty crazy to think that the last guy was part of the same crew that he'd be running around with, Dujek and now Fiddler. Yeah. And this is the chapter where Kalam acquires the book of Drajna from Mebra. <laughs> And then that scene is followed up by Tene Baralta coming in <laughs> and slapping Mebra around for being a little too familiar with him. And then he says, your wounds are uneven, Mebra. Allow me to caress the other side of your face. When Mebra asks that Tene Baralta spare Kalam's life. Uh, <laughs> that quote, the know, way he says it, love it. I think that's one of the reasons I like Baralta. There are some, I mean, I could say this, well, it's, we can't spoil this book, but we can, I'm not going to spoil anything else, but I will say this. There are good villains in this series that it's always makes their compelling people on all sides of these conflicts. 
and Baralt is one that I don't know why I liked him. I think it just, it's probably that lip because Mebros is such a wormy fella. I liked him getting slapped. I didn't get, <laughs> I didn't care if Tene Baralta smacked that old boy. It was like, <laughs> made me like him more. I think both of us kind of had the picture of Benny from The Mummy. <laughs> It's very much. He's very squirrely, and he probably has all the chains on his neck for the different deities <laughs> he needs to break to. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, good gracious, yes. Mesrem is introduced through his interaction with Mapo and Akarium in this chapter. I love Mapo and Akarium. They're, they're, they're great characters, man. Mm -hmm. And then Puss introduced here, <laughs> and he unceremoniously falls off his mule and needs help uncrossing his legs and then he's doing his normal antics <laughs> oh, great. what's soon to be normal it's not new it's not normal yet but it becomes normal <laughs> right <laughs> oh but i love that introduction what a great intro man moving on to chapter three we get a glimpse into what life looks like for Felicin and Hebrick now, and mm -hmm. it's a rough life. It is very difficult to see because, especially due to Felicin's age being 16. We also get to see Coltane's training exercises to prepare the seventh for what's coming, and that includes concussion number one of many <laughs> for Corporal List. Oh, good gracious. I... <laughs> Corporal List. Love that guy. <laughs> and this is why we come to love Corporal List. But this is all core. You know, I think I'm just going to just, just clear this up and just say it for everyone's. There's going to be a core memory associated with almost every one of these chapters in this book in particular. There is, it's just full of them. It's just full of them. This is the beginning of it. And then the seventh eventually comes to terms with their training, and then they are able to actually turn this little conflict around in the training session and earn a day of rest. Yes. That was good. Epic. We are also introduced to the Grawl Gelding, the most legendary of horses. <laughs> it gets the Dassum treatment. <laughs> yes. I think we have several horses in this book. There are some epic horses, but I think this one in particular we know is my favorite because we alluded to this one for months. <laughs> yeah, we had to keep our mouths shut until the incident occurs. Oh, yes. And then finally we were able to let loose. <laughs> oh, my word. That was hard. That was hard. We are treated to the scene where Mapo and Akarium, they're in Tessim, and Pust is giving Mapo this crazy set of directions to get to, I think it was the library. Yes. And yes. Mapo's like, or I could just turn to the right and go 20 <laughs> paces. And Pust is like, yeah, you could do that. You could do that. <laughs> Where's the fun in that, though? And it's like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming he was given directions like looking at a breadboard on a, you know, on a circuit, you know. It's like, go here, go left, go right. Yeah. Go uh, 100 paces, then go another 30 paces to your left. And so, it's, it's walking him into that good stuff, though. Plus, it's hilarious, though. <laughs> This is our first introduction to the Nameless Ones through a little bit of backstory for Mapo. Yep. All right, Chapter 4. Bodin is jailed and then he proceeds to sow chaos when he escapes i think he lights three or four buildings on fire and then disappears and everybody's searching everywhere for him what a maniac well, he's amazing dude uh, I, I'm, I'm agree with you the way he started all that stuff i was like dude what a bad fella yeah lostara yil enters the story as she shadows kalam and she leaves everybody dead in that <laughs> keep yes she does and i look forward to seeing her in the future we find out that the true gate at the end of the Path of Hands is in the bowels of Tessin <laughs> in this chapter. That's wow. chapter four. That's real early in the book to yes. find that information out. Well, I think what I was alluding to a minute ago was the fact that I didn't realize that basically Erickson spells out the entire premise for his book in the first five or ten chapters, and then the rest of it's just tying it all together. Yeah, he sets it up real early. Yeah, he sets it up early. Mm -hmm. gum. We're treated to the scene where Sormo takes Duiker into the Warren of Talon, mm. and they are assaulted by so many soul taken and divers. And I think this is the first time we're introduced to the insect divers yes. because there's some ants in there and some wasps. The bug ones really get me. Oh, yeah, I can tell you. Well, first off, yes, big time core memory on the bug thing. I've become such an arachnophobe. Dude, I was taking a shower the other day <laughs> and there was an enormous dead spider mind you dead in this underneath my shampoo bottle <laughs> mind you it's just for my face because i don't have oh, any wow. hair on my head and dude i come unglued 
<laughs> my wife is like, she heard me in there. She thought I was mad because I sometimes fume and fuss. And oh my word, it's dead, Comron. I can't even take my eyes off where that fella is for the rest of the shower. And I'm in there for like, I'm out of that thing in about 30 seconds. Then I have to call my wife to come here and help watch me while I take care of the corpse. <laughs> wow. <laughs> What kind of spider was it? It's just, you know, kind, of, just, just, just kind of those wolf house wolf spiders. Yeah. But it was a big boy. Okay. And it's one of okay. those where he had that grape size body, you know, and you're like, Oh, it's, it's, oh, it, wow. Yeah. It's just, oh, it just gnarled me out. But notice that I don't think Erickson introduced any spider divers. Oh my gosh. I couldn't take that. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't take that well he does in a way uh, we find out at the end of the book that magora is oh a yeah, spider diver yeah, right? that, that is true <laughs> i'm thinking more like ungoliant so those like giant size you know it's kind of like uh size of small volkswagen kind of spiders <laughs> mm -hmm. the worst bug i've ever had to encounter while in the shower a wasp got in there one time get out of here <laughs> yeah, I don't know how it got in there, but I was keeping my eye on it because it was just kind of hanging out on the window. Right. It wasn't very active. So I was fortunate in that regard. It wasn't flying all over the place and good. I was able to get it. Okay, good. But I was real nervous because oh, yeah. that's one of those ones that got me. I think I told that story where it got me on the arm, I had knocked this nest down yeah. and I was running across my front yard <laughs> screaming. <laughs> Neighbors probably thought I was crazy. <laughs> Oh, no, nah, we're Texans. We've all been yeah. stung by a wasp at some point in our life. <laughs> it's never pleasant. No. All right, chapter five. We get the wonderful scene <laughs> with the Grawl gelding responding to the perceived insult of the guard spitting on the ground. Perceived <laughs> insult. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I love that. <laughs> that is the beginning of just such amazing core memories right there. Oh, my good gracious, that poor guy. <laughs> I think I'd almost rather lose the arm. <laughs> <laughs> really elevating this horse. Immediately after the incident, we have those Eric horsemen trying to buy the horse off of Fiddler. <laughs> then they want Fiddler to go back to their camp. They have the race where the horse gets yes. real spirited and it's really oh. elevated to legendary status. Oh, it's amazing. I, th I think this is, yeah, I'm assuming this is why this is the most legendary horse of all of them is all of those things happening so quick. It's in this chapter that Fiddler and Crocus deduce that Shadow Throne and Cotillion are Kelon Ved and Dancer. And I think that's the first confirmation that we get within the books. I think we had already kind of hinted at it enough that we were pretty sure that's who they were. But this is the first time it's just, yes, these guys are saying for a fact that this is what's going on and this is who those boys are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Leoman and Toblakai are introduced yes. as Kalam delivers the Book of Drajna to Shaikh. Yes. You know, I thought that there was more of Toblakai in this book. There was not. I mean, he was in a, almost every scene Leoman was in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not that much. So yeah. Both of them fellows were not in it very much. I didn't realize that because they played bigger parts in my mind, you know? So when you're first set up to introduce them, you're like, huh, I thought y'all were in this book a lot more. <laughs> you know what's interesting? I just realized that when Shaikh takes her army through the spear, mm -hmm. the warren, travels to Aaron Way, Toblakai's not there with him. Only Leoman's there with him. Yes, it's mentioned that Leoman's there. I, did, I didn't know if he was there or not there, and it's not mentioned, but I guess he's not there. Yeah, Toblakai's not mentioned, and I wonder why. Because he's supposed to be her bodyguard, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Yeah. Did he go off on his little... He might have left already. That may be what it is, okay. You can only have so many big personalities in that party. Yeah, and that's quite the personality. It, 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 yeah. Virtually, as soon as Kalam gives the Book of Drajna to Shaikh <laughs> and leaves, with Apt accompanying him, Shaikh is assassinated, <laughs> which is quite the twist, given the lead up to this whole thing. I know it. <laughs> And then following that, we oh. get to see Toblakai's prowess in battle. Leoman is no slouch either, oh, but yeah. it really, Toblakai is an animal. He's <laughs> on a whole nother level. <laughs> he is next level, isn't he? Woo, yes, and people pay real quick and bad and real bad. In chapter six, Seven Cities goes up in flames. So we've been leading up to this for quite a while. And then finally, the tinderbox is lit and we're off to the races. Yes. Skull Cup is up in flames and Felicin and Hebrick escape with the help of Bodden. We have that horrific blood fly attack. Oh. <laughs> Poor memory on that one. Yes, big time. Oh. It, but what a great escape scene that is. I mean, that, that's, that's right up there with any prison break. I see Skull Cup as like Devil's Island. Almost. <laughs> it's very much like Devil's Island with the blood flies. Oh. 
No, thank you. Devil's Island, is that the one in Papillon? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> There's a leper in that movie yeah. that scarred me as a child because oh, it. it made me <laughs> horrifically terrified of lepers. Right. I get it. I saw that movie. I didn't remember the leper. I just remember him cutting himself to try and get out of the work. I can't remember what it's for. It's been so long. I need to rewatch that. Are you talking about the original or the new? I'm talking about the one with Steve McQueen and it was... Oh, Dustin Hoffman, right? Dustin Hoffman, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I've seen it. It's been so long. I need to go back and watch that. That's a true story. Or based on a true story. Mm. It's in this chapter that Culp and Duiker meet up with Gessler, Stormy, and Truth. <laughs> and that's when they're trying to get the vessel to go rescue Hebrick. Yes, I love these guys. And then we have that amazing escape on the Ripath with Culp using illusions to assist. And that was awesome. I love the fact that Erickson has brought up this idea of the illusion being a very powerful class. And, and Culp proves this by using illusions audibly to keep them alive. I'm really floored by this ability. Well done. Well done, Culp. Yes. There's also a scene in this chapter where the effects of being hit by sorcery are described because Culp and Duiker both are attacked by that mage that's hunting them. Yeah. And I think they both loose their bowels in the process. It's supposed to be quite agonizing. Yeah, that was rough. Fiddler, Crocus, and Absalar come up to the whirlwind from the outside. Mm -hmm. They enter it and find a road from the first empire exposed by all the dust having been lifted in the air. And that's a really cool concept of the bones of the desert being made visible because the whirlwind is lifting all this sand up. Yes, that is a core memory there because the image of this road being so, is, that's the road that's just so arrow straight, right? Yes. That really sticks with me because to do something like that requires, we can't even make a road like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the impression I get. Like we can't make roads like that here. It's like, why are these people able to make such roads? This is, these are ancient roads. These are buried beneath the sands. So they were advanced cultures in the past coming on. It's great. I love that idea. On this road, there's a battle with the Grawl that are continuing oh. to pursue Fiddler. <laughs> it's for that stinking horse, isn't it? Because he wanted that. No, it's because he's imitating one of them. <laughs> oh, that's what it was. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Okay, but that is. But I yeah, love that but, ongoing that running battle. Is amazing though. The whole thing is just amazing. And he hits that group of them with a cusser, and it <laughs> messes them up. <laughs> Those poor horses. <laughs> Oh, yes. Those four horses. And then, I could care less about the Grawl. <laughs> and then finally, Kalam's battle with that desert wolf divers. Oh, yes. I think this is one of the first scenes we see him fighting in the book. Yeah, I believe you're correct. I'm just finally getting to see him in action. Because we didn't see a lot in Gardens because was, that was a group effort in Gardens. He was kind of in the back. But here he, he's seen him front and center taking on them wolves is really, really cool. He was primary on the rooftop battle with the uh, Tistandi and Gardens of the Moon. Yes. I think that's really where we are introduced to, and you don't see him do a lot more other than that, but you're just like, oh my gosh, I got to see more of this guy. He's amazing. Yep. In chapter seven, we find out just how large the refugee train from Hisar is, because Duerger is following in their wake. Oh yeah. What a reveal. Mm -hmm. Hebrick, Felicin, and Bodden come upon that jade finger sticking out of the sand, that huge object. Hebrick touches it and the outcome of that core memory there. Yes, agreed. Core memory on that. Fainer getting ripped unwillingly into the mortal realm. Wild, wild stuff in this one. I mean, <laughs> chapter seven, and then a god or a deity is pulled down to earth just because of his touching this thing. I think he touched the jade, his stump got infected, and his tattoos yeah. got real dark. And then yeah. they pushed that stump that was infected into the sigil of Fainer, oh, the tattoo, and then that's what did it. Yes. I wonder if it's completely destroyed his war. That I don't know. But what this sequence displayed to me was that linkage between the deities and their followers, where it's kind of a two-way yeah. street. They're beholden to each other. Yeah, very much so in this realm. It was in this chapter where Mappo relays the story from his youth, where he snuck into the competing tribes tents while they were sleeping and chipped their tips of their knives and then he had them all in a bag and then another young warrior female came and stole them from him and presumably stole yeah. his heart in the process <laughs> <laughs> yes i love that story it's really kind of sweet and kind fiddler and crew being surrounded by battle for 10 hours as they work their way through this dust storm 
and they're unable to see anything. They're hearing all these crazy noises of screams and battle. You have to assume that Moby was out there defending them in that sand. Dude, that's a awesome realization to know that he... <laughs> I mean, that's a heck of a lot going on there. I think they saw some blood get thrown up against the sand wall around them or something like that. Mm -hmm. They didn't see so much of the battle until the very end or something like that. It was like it was everything was kept out of there. I'm like, I'm assuming it's Moby. And that's just so freaking cool, dude. <laughs> yeah, I think at one point before this battle with the Grawl gets kicked off, they again come up on them here. I think Fiddler's hit from the side with blood spray out of nowhere. You're right. That's what it was. Yeah. He didn't even know what caused it. Blood came out of nowhere and covered him. Yeah. <laughs> when these Grawl charge, we see Absalar's skills in battle. I think we had seen a little bit earlier in the oh. book, but this one really showed it where two of them charged and she kind of ducked under, stabbed them under the ribs and then slid behind the third one's coming up and she launches herself up behind him in the saddle and slits his throat deep. Yeah. Just about takes his head off. Yeah. And it's also stinking effortless. I mean, she didn't even really appear to break a sweat while doing it. Just kind of casually <laughs> did all those things. Yeah. It's here that Grillin appears and Mapo Nicarium come to the rescue. Ikarium gives Grillin a warning <laughs> and Grillin flinches upon receiving this warning. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I love all this part here because we finally get these people to meet up with, this is where they meet Ikarium and Mappo and, you know, Fiddler and company meet these guys. I love it. Right. Fiddler mentions that Grillin came out from under the city of Egatan during the first Malazan conquest of seven cities, I guess he got flushed out by the fires. The city caught on fire. Yeah. So there's a little bit of yeah. backstory there. Grillin right. knew I've... who it was. Oh, that's scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it said something about where Grillin goes. So does madness or something like that. I forget. Yeah, it's a bad deal. <laughs> Definitely. Moving on to chapter eight. As Duerker follows the chain of dogs, he continues to see all of their successes in defending themselves and the refugee train. Oh, that is so beautiful because he's expecting to find nothing but death and he does, but not what he's expecting. When he's starting to see this, put it together, it's starting to, you know, this gets to be core memory here. Just like, dude, that's so cool. Seeing their successes as he's putting it together from trying to find his way to the party. It's in this chapter that Felicin attempts to kill Baden when they're camped on the beach and he predicts it and she gets mad at him like it's his fault <laughs> that she tried to kill him <laughs> right it's your fault i'm so mad at you but yeah yeah she's just always angry that was so funny this is the chapter where that mage is consumed by his warren out of control floating in the sky lightning is going everywhere stormy gessler and truth along with culp they meet up with felice and hebrick and Baden at the beach they attempt to flee that mage in the storm and they get sucked into the warren. Oh, the whole scene is just, that's nothing but high tension through that whole thing. And it's all core, all core memory. And the stormy, he gets slashed by some stuff from the sky and Hebrick uses his tattoos to heal him. That was a really crazy scene. Oh yeah, it was. And it sounded very painful at work, but it didn't sound very pleasant. But no, that force healing, especially when it happens quickly, it seems to hurt every time. Just like when Fiddler yeah. drank that water in Dead House, it healed yeah. his ankle almost instantly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was very painful sounding in a weird way. You'd think it'd feel good to get healed, and it does if healed properly. <laughs> when in the Warren, they find the Salonda, and what a core memory. You have the heads, the bodies, yes. the captain's cabin <laughs> with the tistador frozen in time with a spear through his chest. Yes. Yeah. All the blood that's never dried. Yeah. Gessler figures out how to use that whistle that, that was around the captain's neck. Yes. The descriptions of what the heads do when he starts blowing that whistle, mm, their eyes start rolling around and it's terrible. <laughs> All of this, the whole salon, every time, when you just mention the salon, it's just all core. <laughs> because it's a nightmare. It's just a nightmare alive that these people, it's like, well, uh, okay, got to get on the car. Got to get in the ride and go. It's like, I, I really don't want to get on that boat, but I got no other ride. Yeah. Go to the haunted house. Yeah, it is a bit of a haunted house. Definitely. Fiddler wakes up in Tessim with pus sweeping his face with a broom. What an introduction that is. <laughs> 
<laughs> a good introduction. And we also find out that the Azath are connected together in a little bit of exposition here. Yes, that's a very cool and interesting concept that I know we'll talk about here later. In chapter 9, Kalam finds out that the forces of the apocalypse think the Gistel priest in Aaron is to their benefit. Wow. So this is the first seed that's planted that Malik Rell is going to do what he does at the end of the book. Yeah, big reveal there. Later in this chapter, Kalam comes across Keneb and Manala, along with Keneb's family. Then we're treated to those battle scenes where Kalam single-handedly takes on these bandit camps. Oh, what a madman. And I love all this stuff with, I mean, him coming to the rescue of them and our introduction to Kaneb and both these people. We'll see them more. This really fleshes out Kalam's character from the perspective that he takes these people under his wing when he didn't have to, and he protects them. Yeah. Doesn't know anything about them. Even though he's an assassin, he's very honorable. I think that's kind of interesting. We like so many of the assassins in here, but the assassins that we like are the ones that are somehow honorable. Yes. <laughs> he's one of them. Malik's the other. I mean, Malik's one. And then the other assassins we know of, the only ones I can think of are the Test. The Test and Andy, they, they, they're... They're pretty noble beings, I feel, in some weird way. Yeah, for the most part, they do seem to have a pretty good set of morals on them. Yeah. It was also in this chapter where Kenneb's children are talking with Kalam, and Kalam discourages them from becoming like him. He says that he thinks that fighting should be the last option of any man. This is kind of a similar position to what Whiskey Jack has. It's very similar, and I really like seeing him spell this out. And I know Kaneb appreciated him spelling that out for his kids. I can't remember if Kaneb was still struggling. I know he was struggling with that head wound, so I can't remember if he was awake for that. Or, but I know he appreciated the help. Yeah, he might have been feverish at this point. On board the Salanda, we see these Talani masks show up. They assemble from mud into individuals. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty cool ability right there. Very cool. And it's here that we're introduced to Kurald Emerlon, which is the Tist Edur Elder Warren of Shadow. Later on in that scene, the bone caster Hentos Ilm disappears into the clouds to defeat that mad sorcerer that is causing this <laughs> yeah. rift and this lightning storm in the sky. That rift, once that mage is gone, the way it's described is making people feel sick by looking at it. That was really interesting. Yeah. It's like bleeding pure chaos almost. Yeah. It, the impact on the party is very interesting. I really enjoyed how the uh, the bone caster disappears in the glass to go whip that guy. And he's not doesn't seem to be gone that long either. No. <laughs> it happens very it's quickly. Like, uh, give me one second. I'll be right uh -huh. back. <laughs> I'll be right back. Yeah. <laughs> Gessler immediately offers himself to close this wound when it's mm. established that somebody's wow. going to have to put their soul in there to help seal this rent. What a guy. <laughs> what a guy. What a guy. Yeah. But then we find out that he probably doesn't have the wherewithal to handle that situation. So Lagana Breed, one of the yeah. other Talani mass, allegedly volunteers himself. Later, we find out that one <laughs> of the heads is missing <laughs> from the pile. A body died down in the rowing chamber yeah. of the ship. So that's pretty suspect. This guy wasn't as noble as we thought. He also gave his sword to Stormy for safekeeping here. So that was a pretty touching scene. Yeah, that's true. That's really cool. All right, moving on to chapter 10. Duiker finally meets up with Coltane in the seventh, and we're treated with that amazing scene where he's racing through the enemy camp. The seventh let him through the lines and he makes it in. It's great. Oh, so amazing, dude. Again, this whole, every bit of this book screams big screen. But I'd settle for a, a series on this, on my small screen, but it needs something because there needs to be some heavy visuals that need to be seen with this. <laughs> It'd be beautiful. It's this chapter where we finally get to see the Wiccans and the Seventh in action, where they're defending the refugees as they're crossing the river, where the sappers had secretly built the road under the river yes the end of the battle duiker comes across the scene of those three veterans from the seventh guarding their friend who had taken two arrows and they guarded his body until he died so oh, that yeah. he wouldn't be taken and tortured that scene right there really touched. it is absolutely and duiker thought they were guarding the standard for the army and they were like what are you talking about we don't care about that we just wanted our friend to die in peace they had tears running down their cheeks really amazing yeah it was really touching yeah very much we're treated with that awesome twist that the sappers had built that road under the river because we didn't know what was going on mm. and everybody was <laughs> criticizing the wagons going across first and then the sappers using 55 yeah. cussers to blow this thing up <laughs> 
in a row? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Start with my cloak race right there. <laughs> they were mourning the loss of all those munitions. <laughs> what a crazy bunch. That's a heavy loss, though. <laughs> it's a heavy Absolutely. loss, though. Yes, once you know what they're capable of. Yeah. No. Finally, for this chapter, Sormo Inath takes Duiker along to observe the destruction of the Semp God near that wall of ice that had all those frozen dead things in it. It was melting and chunks of rotting yes. flesh were raining from the sky. Crazy scene. Oh, yeah. That was nasty. It's some really crazy stuff, man. I love it. Core memory there. In chapter 11... Culp uses the undead dragon, which we suspect is that bone caster that we see at the end of the book that's watching Pust and Magora argue. He uses the wake of that undead oh. dragon to get out of the nascent. So they go through Talon, and that's where Stormy and Gesler and Truth get annealed. I'm going to have to ask the question here, because something <laughs> is the undead dragon, this the shyster to land I mass <laughs> that did not sacrifice himself. I don't think it is. I think it might be. Oh, oh, okay. Maybe. Okay. I don't know though. It's ever confirmed that it's that one. Yeah. I think the one you're talking about, I think he has a bear skin on him. So if he does transform, I think it would be to a bear, not a dragon. Oh, into a bear. Okay. I, I right think on. loose memory there. I don't know. If that... You're probably right. I think you're probably right. As Culp follows this dragon through this opening into Talon, the nascent starts to flow through and it gets wider and wider. And he's like, oh, crap, I caused a problem here. <laughs> and he forces Ascendants to help him, but he has to channel their energy. So that, that's a pretty interesting scene. This chapter, the mechanics of magic that are introduced are really appreciated because he's sniffing out different possibilities yes. and he's a pretty tricky guy similar to the way quick ben operates i would think he's yes. got a lot of skill yeah. weaving magic yeah and just seems like it's always left up to the imagination of the wielder i guess and also the skill but also the fact that they are limited by what their body can withstand but it would seem like the ascendants would have given it they gave him so much power he almost couldn't handle it it seemed like at that point. oh yeah i think he regretted asking for help at one point yeah yeah he didn't like that we learn about the Talon and their history with Dancer. And this was through Felicity nice. finding that Talon in Bodden's little pack that he had. We later find out what, what the source of that was. Yeah, that was really cool. I like that. I like that little reveal. We also find out that Dasim Ultor. Dasim Ultor. I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> is revealed to be Decembra, the god of tragedy. Yeah, very interesting reveal. He was sworn to Hood, so you kind of wonder about how that interacts with this. Well, I guess in my mind, it kind of makes a weird sense because he's working for his boss. His boss screws him, doesn't he? But, but we're told that he's betrayed by Hood, right? We don't know what exactly what happened in that scenario yet. No, no, we don't. But what we've been told, it's a very tragic sounding tale. Yes. So enough to make him break hold from his boss, Hood, and I guess that just somehow coming to all this, he ascends to become the god of tragedy. Oh, you think it happens after he was sworn to Hood? Maybe so, in the loss of his beloved daughter. Hood took his daughter. Oh, it's his daughter. Yeah, yeah. Hood took his daughter. Yeah. yeah, that could very well be. Well, I say Hood took his I daughter. All... We find his daughter in Dead House. Who knows how she got there? Yeah. We don't know yet. It may be revealed at some point in the future, but I don't Yeah. <laughs> as far as I know, she's still in there. <laughs> yeah. Taking up space in the floor. <laughs> at least it doesn't rot. At least the meat don't rot. Right. So... And in this chapter, holds are introduced. The elder, more primal versions of Warrens. And we're also introduced to the Bakarala worshiping Pust. They leave their <laughs> leavings on his pillow, <laughs> their gifts to him. And then he has this bag of rocks yes. that he throws at them all the time. And then they collect all the rocks, put them back in the bag, and they reload him every day. <laughs> it's a beautiful cycle. I think he almost fell out a window <laughs> and killed himself by accident, trying to throw a rock at one of these guys. Yes. Yes. He's obsessed with trying to kill them. <laughs> or, or so it appears. And it can all be part of his fakeness. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and this is the chapter where Kalam comes across thousands of crucified Malazan children in that horrific scene. Mm. Oh, that's a tough, yeah. 
tough, tough scene, core memory. It's in the same chapter that Apt interprets Kalam's desire to save the children, and she bargains with Shadow Throne. <laughs> I'm sorry. I really love this because we never know what she says, but the fact that it's revealed her that she's apparently very, very intelligent. <laughs> and just, we've been kind of functioning that she's kind of, is she mindless? We don't know anything. She's so alien. It's like, we don't know anything about her, but here it's like, dad mm -hmm. She's got the squirreliest ascendant of all on the ropes with her logic. It's like, dude, that's great stuff. <laughs> In chapter 12, this is where Dewaker is forced to accompany the raid to kill that new <laughs> war leader that has had much success against Coltane in the seventh. This is where the nameless Marine is introduced on this raid. Love it. Lull forces Dewerker into that tunnel underground and Dewerker was having none of it. And Lull's poking his feet with the sword. <laughs> yeah. That was hilarious. <laughs> they get out and then oh. the Wiccan warlocks summon that elemental. It's chaos in this camp. That Semp God is just a savage. Everything is sewn shut, extremely powerful, is a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. Do you think he's just constipated? <laughs> you could say so. I think so. It's basically this power is trapped within. And in a way, it's constipation of, of this power. Yeah, yeah, kind of in a weird way, yeah. We get to see Duiker actually still has some moves with his sword. He really has a good yeah. display. He takes on three or four different rebels and is able to function well. Following this battle, the sappers were bantering with each other on the way back to camp. I always appreciated that. <laughs> you get to see a little bit of that crazy psychology. Oh, absolutely. And they are crazy. Unbeknownst to us, Pearl, Lostara, Yil, and Apt show up and save the day on this raid. There's yes. a couple throwing knives that are there, and then Apt is in there fighting the Semk God. Upon the destruction of the Semk God, Panic attempts to grab that piece and apt slaps his head <laughs> that's great Dude, that is, there is so much that goes on there and it's just solid acts this is just non-stop it's all but it's so great it's so it's so, it's so brutal it's brutal funny hard mean he's got it all he captures it all here just amazing stuff Leading up to this, the seventh and the Wiccans were desperate for water. And then Dewerker puts two and two together and realizes that when they went in that tunnel under the ground to infiltrate the camp, there was water. So the army is able to rehydrate. Yes. That was a morale booster. That's a big deal. This is the chapter where Felicin, Hebrick, and Culp enter the ruins of the first Empire City under that eroded mesa. Yeah. And they find all those fossilized people everywhere frozen in the middle of a ritual some of them were changing into other animals soul taken or, di or divers could be a combination of the two was this where we found out that this was this a, the first outbreak of this madness i don't know if it was the first one but i think it happened all over the empire it's probably one of the reasons why it doesn't exist anymore yeah because it talked about that was a kind of like almost like a religious movement i remember that going on there but this whole everything about that city it's got a very hp lovecraft vibe to it finding cities under places that have been buried for millennia and finding these things here which are they still even alive and trapped in there or are they all dead petrified there i can't remember if they were some alive and some dead i can't remember but it's a weird and horrific scene though i think they were all frozen and, and fossilized. I don't think any of them were alive. Okay, okay. As Kalam traverses the Imperial Warren, he sees the sigil from Kalor, and we realize that the ashes that cover the Imperial Warren are made up of what used to inhabit the Imperial Warren. So it's literally a civilization burned to ashes. <laughs> yes. That's a really heavy reveal right there. And what's so crazy about this reveal, I don't even know what it's revealing, but it's it's massive, whatever the reveal is, <laughs> as we learn our way around this world. Kalam thinks back to Kalor being an ally of Kaladan Brood, and he was thinking about what Kalor calls himself. He calls himself the High King, but he's a king with no kingdom. He claims to have ruled over multiple civilizations he's over a thousand years old all this stuff sounds like delusional so far yeah sounds delusional but then kalam sees this sigil under the ashes here in the imperial war and it gives some credence to what calor yeah as they're camping keneb relays the story of what happened between manal and her husband which is horrific where he beat her and then force healer using the squad mage it's terrible but then keneb took things into his own hands made me love keneb oh yeah all right. 
moving on to chapter 13. The Wiccan cattle dog makes off with the Hengi's roach dog. <laughs> Little do we know what's going on here. We think it's about to get eaten. <laughs> yeah, it's such a good scene. Such a funny scene. Core. <laughs> yeah. The nameless Marine is eyeballing Duiker after his display of skill with his sword during that raid. Yes, doesn't that catch him some remarks from somebody? Yes, I think Captain Lowell was making some comments about it. There it was. Yes, that's what it was. Yeah. It's this chapter where the sappers disappear before the battle. Some people think they deserted. We're treated to that epic battle sequence where we have the Marines, they're fully surrounded, they're contracting and expanding in a very controlled movement, very disciplined. Yes. Then we have the Wiccans, they sacrifice that beautiful mare, the life force is used for them to charge yes. up that impossible hill. At the most opportune moment, the sappers come up from under the ground and they're throwing sharpers everywhere and sowing chaos. It's such an amazing battle sequence. Yeah. Absolutely, dude. Combine all that stuff together. It's one of my core battle memories from the entire series. I agree because the whole scene is evocative of the odds they're facing anyhow. This whole thing is a running battle uphill for these guys. And here they are taking a running battle uphill quite literally and actually succeeding. <laughs> Total core memory there. Just awesome. Kalam ends up in Squall Inn within Aaron. And that's the inn that had the bowl in the center and all that nastiness was collecting and a rat was chewing on some guy's face that was laying down in there the nasty 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 it's absolutely disgusting and hilarious when viewed from the outside but i would not want to be in there at all this is where we're introduced to carther on crust we didn't know it at the time it's confirmed later yes much later as kalam is preparing to leave <laughs> He is going to leave without saying goodbye to Keneb and the children. Manala gets pissed and throws a melon and it hits him in the head. That's pretty funny. Nice. Good aim. Yeah, good aim too. <laughs> Lostara arrives in Aaron and is promptly arrested along with all the other Red Blades. He gets thrown in jail. Mm. And that plays a big part later. It does. I did not realize how crucial that was. Yeah. And the Red Blades are some of the most loyal people to the Empire. Yeah. Finally, Minala deciding to follow Kalam. That's pretty bold. I enjoyed that. It's very bold. All right, chapter 14. Hebrick holds the weight of Culp and Felicin as he uses his ghost hands to climb down that cliff face through the whirlwind. We had that really cool visual image of the whirlwind from above, and then they go down into it, and it's yeah. a sandblaster. It's eating away Felicin's skin. And Culp is protecting himself, yeah. and she later asks, why didn't you protect me? <laughs> it's like, I forgot. We don't like you, Felicin. We don't like you. <laughs> um, but I love this scene. This is a real favorite scene of mine. It's a big-time core memory. Because I always love anything that's kind of superheroic, and that's very superheroic. A dude, got, he's got two people strapped on his back, and he is just not even using his feet, just his hands mm -hmm. that aren't even there to climb down this face. This, that's just totally awesome. And when they get down on the ground, we're treated to that scene with the merchant. He's got those undead servants that are hemming and hawing about, about oh, their death. How bad their deaths were. Oh, my death was worse. It's a very <laughs> tension-filled scene. And then it ends with Grillin dissembling into his rat form. Culp gets eaten alive, and then Bodden comes to rescue them. But, you know, he's in rough shape after that. Yeah, this is a... Big time core memory, and that's far up. He called. He was a good help. I would love to have seen him go further in this series, but he he did good. Yeah, yeah, he did really good. So we lost a couple important people here because Bodden also dies in this chapter, and we get that yes. really heart wrenching scene where Felicin has his head in her lap. He's just a burned husk basically at that point, and she's trying to comfort him as he dies. Yeah, because he'd followed them with like no eyes or anything like this for who knows how long in the desert before he f stumbled up on them after they escaped because he bought them time to escape and then he catches up to them somehow and she, you know, he dies in her hands and it's like i hated that because he was so awesome but i love the sacrifice play but hated to lose him though definitely we find out that shaik is reborn but we don't know who came up to the party of leoman and tobakai right 
we didn't know if it was Absalar or right. Felicin that came up because it was looking like it was going to be Absalar and her father that came up. Yes. All right, chapter 15. This is where <laughs> Kalam gets on the rag stopper and he's down in the hold talking to that sailor. Oh. And that sailor starts mouthing off. And then Kalam's like, I'm one of those perfumed dandies. Oh. And the guy starts cussing under his breath. <laughs> oh, God, that's so good. <laughs> Well, even the, and the other thing that's brought up is the guy under the deck talks about the fact of not, that, that all the rags are already soaked anyhow. It's like, dude, we haven't even set sail. Yeah. <laughs> and this thing is sinking. It's like, come on. Three people like, manning the bilge pumps. Yes, yes, at all times. It's, it's like all times. Oh. Back at the chain of dogs, the leadership was having a meeting and Bolt asks Sormo where Bent was. That's the big dog. And Sormo informs him that he's only nine feet away in the tall grasses and everybody's looking for him. The legend <laughs> of those dogs, man. That's unnerving. It is. Yes, love those dogs. We also learn with a little bit of backstory that Emperor Kelon Ved and Dasim Ultor had reshaped the Empire's military into a meritocracy. It doesn't seem to be working that way anymore. No. No, it does not, but it seemed to have done a lot for the time that Kelon Ved had the control, though it seemed to work pretty well for him. It did. We find out that it was Felicin and not Absalar that came to Leoman and the Toblakai. Yeah, big time switcheroo. Yep. <laughs> Hebrick and Toblakai immediately don't like each other. Toblakai says, I'm not going to talk to you again until I'm ready to kill you. <laughs> and I can't remember what chapter it is, but. Well, I know it. I know it. I can't either. But. <laughs> I love it when it doesn't happen, though. When they actually get at it, Hebrick throws this guy 20 feet or so. That's crazy. He deftly blocks the blade coming at his head. The blind man deftly blocks the blade and then throws the giant fella. The seven foot tall <laughs> away away. giant man. And Hebrick is described as being toad like. So you always assume he's kind of short. Maybe he's like five, yeah. eight, something, five, six, five, five, eight, something like that. It's the veto, dude. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's the little five, veto. two, something like that. Okay. Throwing a yeah, nearly yeah. seven foot tall giant. Yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. Hebrick also notes that Toblakai drags a chain of souls in his wake, which is an interesting visual. Yeah, I want to know more about that. And it was in this chapter that we found out that Tremorlore pins a fragment of a shattered warren in place. And we later find out that that's likely related to Ikarium attempting to free his father, Gothos, from an Azath. That's probably how it formed. Yeah, exactly. It's here that we find out what Ikarium is capable of when he goes into a rage. He's able to level cities and kill thousands of Talan Imas single-handedly. I think this is when they went into that town. Yeah. He saw the machine that he created and everything around it was destroyed. Yes. And the fact that he kills thousands of Talan Imas <laughs> single-handedly, that's a horrifying statement. <laughs> Right there. Yeah. When you think about it, he's half Jag. So it makes sense yeah. Yeah. given how powerful they are. Oh, yeah. The Talan are going to be seeking it out all the time, you would think. But they don't seem to be actively looking after this old boy, do they? No, they don't seem to be. No, which is interesting. Interesting. You'd think they'd be hunting him. Yeah, he's dangerous. In Chapter 16, we see the reemergence of the Hengiz Roach Dog and its apparent dominance over the Wiccan Cattle Dogs. So a new alpha <laughs> appears in the pack. <laughs> and I love it. It's that little lap dog yeah, is the alpha it. in these bad boys. I mean, get, get, get out of here, dude. Yeah. That's like my grandmother's poodle. When she had a poodle, I could just see this poodle being carried around by some of this mastiff <laughs> and bossing it around, you know? And it's here that Bolt has a botched attempt at assassinating that dog and he misses and he starts cussing. It's hilarious. <laughs> Oh, we are treated to the re-emergence of Gessler and company. They're relaxing <laughs> under a canopy that they set up. Oh, and then Coltane oh, and right. Duiker yes. and Bolt show up and they, <laughs> it, it was here that Coltane punches Gessler that's in the face, uh, right? Is that where, <laughs> yes, I think it, it is. It has to be because they send Gessler oh, away. His yeah. on his face. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's too funny. This is the chapter with the River Vathar crossing, which is a tragedy. We have that amazing yeah. imagery painted with the butterflies flitting everywhere. Every image of this, yeah. those are heavily in all of the pictures. Because I always envision the river that has cut 
into the rocks and you have trees on either side and you just have this river of yellow flapping floating butterflies in the middle over everything getting in people's yeah. mouths and absolutely. eyes and stuff absolutely the chaos of that crossing and the fact that the sappers the marines and the wiccans were able to make barricades out of the nobles wagons once they got stuck down in the worst part of the crossing the sappers were then able to go yeah. up into the trees and sow some chaos among those archers that were up there corbola dom's archers yeah finally we have sormo's death scene which is rough yeah the whole crossing, everything you just mentioned there, all of that is all core memory. There, there's three or four, I can't remember, battles here that are just such epic set pieces that they just always stand out, head and shoulders. And this whole book is stand out. But those things stand out even more because he just paints such a beautiful and brutal image at the same time. It just absolutely blows me away. Yeah. The books that are coming out this year from The Broken Binding, the hardback books they've commissioned some really beautiful art mm -hmm. and one of the art pieces that they have is the river vathar crossing but what surprised me was there was not a single oh. butterfly in the picture get out of here and the original artist posted the image on twitter it's a good piece of art don't get me wrong but i asked and i didn't really get a yeah. response i was like did you intentionally choose not to put the butterflies in the picture because it's so prominent throughout the whole chapter they're constantly described as being everywhere. Yes. And I would think that that would be yes. a huge influence on it. Yellow, the dust, it just coats everything. Why would you not at least put one in the bottom right corner or something, for goodness sake? Give some kind of nod. To Maybe it. it was a decision because it would obfuscate too much of the picture. I don't know. I would think that there'd be a way to, if you draw the right angle, you could show it. I don't know. Yeah. We find out that the Azath perpetually imprison their captives. Yet the mental faculties of those individuals stay in place. That's a pretty scary That's thought. That's not cool. No. I don't love this. <laughs> yeah, I don't love it either. <laughs> Being tied up, bound underground by roots, you're just stuck oh, with your thoughts. Awful. Crocus is able to force Pust to get Shadow Throne to assist with their endeavor to go into Tremorlore. So they get the hounds to help them out. Yeah. Way to go, Crocus, man. Yeah. That was impressive. <laughs> Way to force an ascendant to do your bidding, yes. <laughs> Chapter 17. We get the voyage of the Ragstopper. This is where Kalam and Salky Lan mm. are fending off the pirates, and Kalam is fighting the Inkaral on board the ship. That was a really cool fight scene. Yeah, that whole thing. That's a great chapter. That whole there's not much other than that going on. That's a you know, that's a heck of a the whole thing is on board this ship. It's great. <laughs> then they send that treasure overboard. Love that. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> This might have been the chapter where Hebrick threw Toblakai. Oh, yeah. That could be it. All right. Chapter 18. We learn more about the Nameless Ones and their connection to the Azath. A little bit more backstory. Any of the breadcrumbs I love. Mesrim appears again, and he saves the day, but ends up being the first casualty for the party, which is sad. So he was the red shirt? Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Unfortunately. Really, yeah, and I really liked Mesrim, too. He was, he was a very likable fellow. Yeah. Then Grillin reappears, and Ikarium loses it. No. Legit loses it. It's everything Mapo can do to try and keep him under control. Great scene there. Great scene. This is the chapter where Shaikh raises the Pillar of Sand. It is towering over the continent. Duerker can see it. Not only Duerker, oh, probably yes. everybody on the continent yeah. can see it. Yeah, that's a very core, a very core scene there. Fiddler, this is where he reaches into his bag as a last-ditch effort and finds what he thinks is a cusser. It turns out to be that conch shell that Kimlock gave him, and he unleashes that Spirit Walker song, which is quite powerful, kills all that stuff. Yeah, it's very powerful, and I don't even know if we've seen the end of that yet. <laughs> no, I don't think we have. Plus, he curses the sappers and asks who invented them, <laughs> which <laughs> is ironic given Kelonved, his boss, invented them. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah, he invented him, and he's like, who, who, and he's, and he's cursing them. That is so funny, mm -hmm. dude. Who invented them? Love that. Chapter 19. We come across the burial grounds for those Talani mass, and we see the skulls in the trees facing the sunset or the sunrise. I thought that was pretty yes. cool. Instead of being buried in the ground, they, they do that. Oh. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. And I mean, it's quite interesting. It's haunting, but kind of lovely in a way because these poor fellows can't continue. But what are you going to do? You know, that's, that's, that's about the best option. 
gives them something to look at at least. We get this beautiful scene where Coltane finally pins down the sappers and he accidentally demotes their captain. <laughs> it's so great. And, and that whole back and forth, it's just so heartwarming. The sappers reaction was yes. beautiful and just love it. I think that is quite, th this book has several laugh out loud moments. And I mean some big laugh out loud moments, but that's probably biggest one for me. Yeah, definitely. And we find out in this conversation that Mincer, the newly demoted captain, carries a bag of rocks on his back for when his weapon breaks, but he also is unable to hit that roach dog with any of his rocks and bolt has a choice <laughs> comment about that. It's great. Oh, that is too funny. Back in Tremorlor, we find out that the Denrabi that Fiddler killed at the beginning was not a soul taken. It was in fact a divers. <laughs> That's way worse. Now you got three channel digging machines <laughs> coming at you or however many it was. <laughs> Oh, that's awful. Yeah, it's like, and they're mad. Oh, yeah, they're mad. Yeah, they want some revenge. And they're angry. <laughs> now, the way the hounds assaulted these things by going right down their gullet, beautiful. Love that imagery. You wouldn't think oh, a hound beautiful. would do that, but it's great. Yeah, they're next level. We're introduced to the Trigal Trade Guild. Their mission to resupply Coltane sent by Dujek, that's really uplifting at such a trying time. Yes. It's a core memory for me, them showing up. And then also their resupply of Fiddler with the munitions. That's great. Oh, yes. I forgot about the resupply. Yes. That makes Fiddler's day. That made my day. <laughs> We're provided a little bit of additional detail regarding the relationship between the Jagoot and the Talani Mass, which is much appreciated getting all of that. I still feel like the Talani Mass sound like the bad guys, though. I think we've talked about it at length over this book but in that scenario it's hard to sympathize with them it is unless you look uh, the only thing that i think that would maybe drive them so hard is how many millions of talan were killed when these guys would erect these walls and starve them out by killing all the life forms they fed up on and things like that yeah i see that side of it they carried a little too enthusiastically far but, you know, it's like, uh, come on, guys. But, yeah, I don't know if I'm ever going to be made whole on this one because I, I think I'm feeling a little bit different about the Talan after this reveal, especially from the Jagoot ghost. When you're young, it's easy to look at the world in a binary way. You know, it's black and white, good and evil. And then as you age, you yep. start to realize it gets a little bit gray in some areas because you can see both sides of it here. The Jagoot just want to be left alone. The Talan I mass while they do have a right to live they also over hunted their hunting ground so who's to say that they're not the bad guys on their side as well by making all the wildlife extinct i don't know that's true it's more complicated than just this is good and this is bad is i guess ultimately my point yes it's a very complex thing here we also receive a little bit of additional information about lacine outlawing dujek as part of a larger tactic to take on the panion Domin. This isn't the conversation with Kalam. This is actually from somewhere else that we get this information. We also have the twist of the Kundril turning on the other tribes to support the Wiccans and giving them time to escape. Mm, dude, that was amazing. Uh, that's, a, that's a core memory right there because I just love those guys. Wiccans! Yeah. <laughs> Wiccans! <laughs> it's just so, so awesome, man. This makes the hair stand up when I think about it. It's just great stuff, dude. All right, chapter 20. We find out that Ikarim's power, when he brings it to bear, is channeled through his sword, which is an interesting way to do it. Normally, you wouldn't think about it that way. Yeah. Tremorlor makes a move to capture the hounds, which is not unsurprising. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's a tempting meal. Tremorlor opens for Moby, of all things. Everybody else, it didn't open for. That was quite the surprise. Yeah. And then finding out that Moby is a soul taken, that's also quite a twist. Yeah, that's where it's revealed that he was protecting them too, wasn't it? Right. They don't have concrete evidence, but they surmise that's what was going on. Right. They also find Dasim Ultor's daughter in stasis within Tremor lore. So how she got there, what she's doing there, nobody knows. Nobody knows. <laughs> I don't know if we'll ever know either, but I want to know. <laughs> We find out that the Malazan soldiers in the 7th gave up their pay, they donated it, to pay for the passage and escort of the refugees to Aaron. 
or at least as far as that tribe would take them. And that was very touching. Dude, that still stands with me. That's core memory because just, I mean, the fact that these people, that the Wiccans, uh, you know, cared so much that, that they you know, take it so seriously. It's like, we're going to give money to make sure that they get there because we promise we get them there. Amazing. Yeah, it's both the Wiccans and the Seventh, though. Oh, that's right. They mean about the Seventh. But knowing now what we know about how nobody came to help them, it makes that tragedy even worse because they gave everything to get the refugees to Aaron and nobody did anything to support them. Oh, yes. And they could have helped. But they did succeed in getting them to Aaron. They could have, but they didn't get them to Aaron because I don't think they had any intention of living. I thought that's why they gave that money to begin with. They had written themselves off. So or that's why I understood that. We're treated to this beautiful conversation between Panic and Cotillion. I really enjoy seeing the human side of Cotillion coming out a little bit. Yes, I do too. I thought it was hilarious, though, when Panic was saying, does he imagine that he now walks unseen? <laughs> Still get that Cartman oh, dude, image dude. of fun times with weapons. <laughs> Oh, yeah. No one can see me. Yeah, it's exactly how I think about that, too, because it's what's weird to me is the fact that it's what could see through something like that. I mean, that, that I assume that where these guys, where, you know, Cotillion is using, I'm assuming Elder, which, you know, I'm assuming Shadow is Elder if it's part of the first threes. And now this is all assumption on my part, but how is this kid able to see through Elder stuff? Because I think Elder is considered stronger than your normal run of the mill kind of stuff, isn't it? Does that, you know, am I making sense in my question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the way I think about it is human beings can see a certain spectrum of light and there are animals that see a wider spectrum of light. Uh, so in this case, I think of it as a similar thing. That's true. Apt and panic must have some expanded vision capability that allows them to see a wider spectrum of magics. Yes. I agree. <laughs> we find out that Sulk Elan is actually Pearl, and he's exposed when he lets mm. us know that he's frozen Kalam in place. He stabs him, throws him overboard. He has to tell him his whole bad guy story. Yes. <laughs> as he's doing it. Yes. Yes. He's going to apparently have an appointment with Topper. Oh, yes, he does. <laughs> we'll see what happens to him. We get confirmation that Pearl was using Makra. And that Cartharon Crust is alive. So that was in this chapter. That's a big reveal about Crust in particular. Another of the old guard appearing. Yes. Finally, Minala jumps the stallion overboard to make it ashore and follow Kalam. Again, just showing her impressive capabilities, but also her excessive willpower in making things happen. Yes. Well said, sir. I would like her to begin with, but the fact that she did that, you're like, wow, that's bold. Good job. All right. Chapter 21. Shike's spear toppling and turning into a road to carry her army to Aaron swiftly. That was surprising. Yes. Great visual core memory. Yeah. <laughs> and then the great tragedy of the fall where Coltane, the Wiccans and the seventh die so close to Aaron. Nobody goes to help them get mad. Just thinking about it. Oh yeah. The tragedy of it really cements it to me though. It is one of the most memorable things in a book. Yes. I agree. You take that combined with the crows coming to take his soul and squint freeing his soul and then the epilogue together and it's just, it takes it to the next level. It does. And I agree with everything that you just said. It's amazing, dude. Yeah. All of that is just so, it stays with you. And poor Squint having to bear the burden of releasing Coltane's soul. You know, I do feel for him. Yeah, I do too. The fact that he has to carry that burden. And what's bad is, he, you know, he sees himself as everyone be hating him. And it's like, it's actually there. He's not seen that way at all. But he'll always carry that as a burden. Be real tough to get over. Oh, yeah. Nil and Nether having to watch Coltane die. From their perspective, they virtually worship him. Not being able to do anything about it would be terrible. That'd be awful. I agreed. And then Pormqual, that inept idiot. <laughs> oh, yeah, he got what he had. I don't know if he got what he deserved. He certainly got an outcome that he, he paid. <laughs> led himself into. Yes, nicely stated, sir. <laughs> All right, chapter 22. We get to witness Kalam's legendary abilities as an elite assassin as he works mm. his way from the shore through Malice City. Dude, that is awesome. Yeah. And every word you said was so beautifully stated. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and then we see that really cool image 
inside the Azath Warren, almost Tron-like with the tiles going out to every horizon. Black sky. Yeah. Really neat. Yeah, very interesting. And we witness Malik Rell's final manipulation and the betrayal of Pormqual. What a yeah, greasy, I, I, slimy. Oh, what are all the things Magora says about Pust? I forget everything she says, but it's, <laughs> it kind of works toward Malik Rell, though. It does. <laughs> it's none of it's flattering. Oh. Keneb remembering what he heard about the Gistel priest and his ability to, to save Aaron, that, that one thing change the tide change the tide dude that was amazing well done kid yeah absolutely well done tragedy on top of tragedy we have the crucifixion of Pormqual's army ending with duiker if oh. you thought it wasn't bad enough with coltane dying now we have to witness this and then the description of duiker getting crucified really yeah. grinds my teeth it just makes me Mm. Yeah, because he had to sit there and watch all 10,000 of these people be crucified first. Yeah. And then wait for his, he's the last. Yeah, terrible. <laughs> it's like, ouch, that's awful. Chapter 23, we have the continuation of Kalam's rampage through Malice City. <laughs> you say rampage, I'm always thinking of Archer. Rampage! <laughs> <laughs> and then Manala coming to save the day, showing that a one-man army really isn't a thing. He had to have yes. help. Needed a good woman's support. <laughs> we get a little bit additional information about the nameless ones manipulating Mappo. We find out that they're the ones that killed his tribe and blamed it on Ikarium to get him to take on this yeah. task of escorting Ikarium. Dastardly. Sorry, I don't get to say that enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's here that Gothos appears as the guardian of Dead House, which that name's been around since Gardens of the Moon, so quite surprising to see him show up mm -hmm. we get that additional bit of information about gothos being happy being trapped as a guardian of an azath it's a tragedy from the perspective that ikarium is trying to free his father thinking he's trapped there against his will and he wants to be there so that just makes it even more sad it does. This is all a core memory for me because the, the thing that so hurts me is the fact that Ikarim isn't even looking for his dad anymore. <laughs> Doesn't appear to be. He's looking for something. Yeah, but he doesn't know what. He doesn't know what he's looking for. He's looking for something, but got no idea. And you're like, dude, he's looking for his dad. That's what he's looking for. And that's what I think. And he doesn't know it. And you're like, oh, that's awful. Yeah. And then we have Lacine's conversation with Kalam, which paints a whole different picture of Lacine. Wow. Dude, absolutely paints a different picture of her and shows that she's actually quite the planner. She's actually not so, she's not stupid. She's most assuredly not stupid. And she's able to convince Kalam to, well, whatever, <laughs> to not kill her <laughs> at least. Would you put her at Mentat level of schemer? Well said, I think so. <laughs> yeah, she's kind of Mentat level schemer. I, I think so. Yeah. So after this meeting with Lacine and Kalam decides he's not going to try and kill her anymore, Manala and Kalam are saved by Fiddler and company and Apt. They go to the Realm of Shadow. And then we have that scene with Shadow Throne bestowing gifts upon everybody. <laughs> and yes. it's a good scene from the perspective that I do like hearing Shadow Throne talk more. We got it a couple times in this book. Yes. He's not that unlike pust he may not seem as crazy but you kind of see where it comes from a little bit <laughs> yeah i think the funny part from this meeting is the fact that fiddler gets lippy with shadow throne you're just the emperor and gets by with it and it gets kalam to get lippy with him and and shadow throne shuts kalam down on that though like i'll have none of that from you but he'll take it from fid uh -huh. <laughs> well he does give fiddler that compliment about with soldiers such as these it's no wonder we conquered half the world. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's right, dude. And then chapter 24, Truth trying to help those dogs that were butchered and tortured. Yes, mutilated. Yeah, and Mappo's kind gesture in giving the last two elixirs he had to heal those dogs was really touching. Oh, yeah. Very touching. And the fact that, you know, he's using his life. I, I don't know why I'm reminded. It's like a D&D &D part where you got to give up those elixirs. And it's like, Dad, gummit. I needed those, but those dogs need it more. Mm. And he, I love that. It's real, real, real lovely. And then we finally find out why Pust was trying to eliminate all those spiders throughout the book. And it's Magora. Right. <laughs> who's a perfect match for him. <laughs> oh, yes. A match made in hell right there. <laughs> 
we find out what the nameless Marine wrote on that cloth which it really gets me. Oh, it does. The fact that he never asked her name, and that's the one thing she wrote on there. It's rough. Get you. It's rough, dude. It gets you. And then Mappo's choice not to tell Ikarium about any of the experiences they had in this entire book. Get that reset. <laughs> yeah, he's like, as far as Ikarium is concerned, nothing happened. He's not even been on this adventure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like he doesn't even know. It's like, dude. You went on. You, you were with these guys for a long time. You know, it's like months. Made new friends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Forgot them. <laughs> you made them and forgot. Them. <laughs> the epilogue, the oh. entire thing, the way oh, yeah. it's painted with the widow going and kneeling. She's got the vial in her hand. She's about to drink it. The horsewife grabs her wrist, won't let go. You know, it's almost breaking her wrist. How hard she's clamped down. Yes. You know, it's the whole thing with the crows coming. It's just legendary yes. end to Chilling. a beautiful book. Absolutely phenomenal ending to this book, dude. So for final thoughts, I'd like to thank everybody, all of our patrons and listeners for continuing to come along with us on this journey. Keep the emails coming. We Absolutely. really appreciate hearing from you. And yes. next week we will be back with Memories of Ice. Yes. And I just want to say thanks to everyone. I cannot thank y'all enough for all the support y'all have given us. And we do look forward to seeing y'all next week as we begin Memories of Ice. This is a great book and we can't wait to see y'all there. Great job today, Billy. Hey, good episode, man. Loved it. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. See y'all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com. Thank mm-hmm. you.